All right. Thank you. And I want to thank uh, my colleague Randy and Colleen as well for inviting us out to this. It's been great. Uh, we have a, a dino fest we do every fall in L.A. And we're going to have to keep upping our game because you guys put on a really good show here. So I'm, I'm kind of taking notes as we go throughout this weekend as well. Uh, I am going to cheat a little bit on your theme, you know, because I know the theme is about the origin of dinosaurs and the earliest dinosaurs. Uh, I'm going to hedge a little bit and talk about the first dinosaurs that we get in Antarctica. And I'm going to tell kind of a little story about, uh, you know, why we go to Antarctica, you know, what do we want to do down there, um, how we do the work that we do in Antarctica, what is, what is it like to collect fossils in Antarctica, and then give you kind of a little rogues gallery of the different animals that we know from Antarctica, what is the new stuff that's kind of on the horizon that we're working on and finding, and hopefully leave you with a little teaser as well. Uh, but I'll start by pointing out uh, we just had a pretty big anniversary in Antarctic exploration. Does anybody recognize these folks? I'm not in this picture, by the way. <laughs> Close, right? This is uh, Robert Falcon Scott, right? So the reason that these guys are not looking too happy and are a little shabby is because they just found out they were second place, right? Uh, they got to the pole, but uh, several weeks after Amundsen had got there, um, all of them actually perished on the way back. Uh, now they're man hauling all their sledges and everything with all their gear so it's really grueling taking stuff back they actually get socked into a storm and they're only about 11 miles from another su supply depot right but they're they're weak they're socked in by the storm and they, they ultimately perish kind of one by one but as they're going and kind of lightening the load throwing stuff off the sleds that they don't need anymore because they're just racing to get back to, to the depots into these camps one of the things they don't throw away is about 45 kilograms of Permian Glossopteris fossils, right, from near the head of the Beardmore Glacier. So even back then, you know, more than 100 years ago, these guys recognized how important this was for telling kind of the tale of Antarctica as being a different place in the past than it is today. This is kind of a reconstruction of what this plant looks like, right? So this is kind of some of the, the earliest cases of stuff coming back from Antarctica. Um, but we've got a lot more to talk about now in the modern era. Uh, a lot of times when I talk about Antarctic dinosaurs, this is what people conjure up in their head, right? It's some <laughs> picture like this. But not us in this crowd, right? We're coming in, we're coming in at a higher level, right? You know, we might think that because of the way the continents are arranged on the Earth today. We've got two polar ice caps. We've got the continents splayed apart, kind of the, the most they've ever been, really. Everything widely separated. Um, but you guys know that if we kind of scale things back to about 190 million years ago, we've got a very different world. No polar ice caps. We've got Pangea, Pangea still largely coalesced. Um, and we've got much more equitable climates. We've got differentiation, but uh, climate was much different during that time. Again, one of the reasons that we want to get down to Antarctica is to understand what life was like at high latitudes back then. We can also answer questions about biodiversity, right? Everybody's been harping on this throughout DinoFest. If, if we look at this old classic graph of kind of uh, diversity running through time here, we can kind of point out five of the big major mass extinction events that are happening here. And if we want to go to the central Trans-Antarctic Mountains, we actually have rocks, uh, a series of sedimentary rocks, that bound two of these big mass extinction events, including the end Permian, um, but also rocks that are kind of on either side of our end Triassic mass extinction, although we're, we're missing some gaps in between. Right. So I've been involved in Antarctic research since I was an undergrad, uh, and I've gotten to go on three expeditions there. We just got back, uh, actually around this time last year, I would have been in Antarctica near the Shackleton Glacier, collecting fossils that are older than the dinosaurs. Um, these uh, uh, projects are all funded by the National Science Foundation, so thank you for paying your tax dollars. Uh, I know that since the government just reopened, everybody and my colleagues that are down there working now are happy that the plane's going to come back for them. Um, <laughs> otherwise, they're going to be spending a lot of time here in McMurdo Station, which isn't that bad. McMurdo's kind of being like in a small mining town. There's, in the summer, there's over 1,000 people that are working out of there. And it's here, kind of around the coast, where you get kind of your iconic Antarctic wildlife. This is where you see your emperor penguins, right, really cute guys, Weddell seals, Give me some more Oz. There's a baby in there, right? It gets cuter. Seal pups. All right. All right. And even though there's a thousand researchers down there, there's still more penguins. Right? All of those little dots are little teeny Adeli penguins. You know? And these are the curious guys. <laughs> the 
So this was kind of a, a camp that we set up to kind of try out our gear because we want to make sure everything works before we get out in the middle of nowhere, right? You don't want a big hole in your tent when you open it up for the first time. We can burn some to a CD for you. And this is kind of a group in 2003 yeah, that actually, decided I'll, I'll they'd investigate, you. you know, what these big yellow tents are doing right around side. The penguins want to go in the tent. Oh, no! Yeah. And they love to mug it up for the camera. But that's on the coast. Where we're actually going is further into the center of the continent, uh, the central part of the Transantarctic. So there's a mountain range that cuts across the entire continent there. So we're not actually digging through ice or anything like that. We're actually going to where rock is exposed at the surface through, through the ice. Um, this mountain range runs throughout. There's been a, a number of projects kind of in these areas. We're going to focus on for our dinosaurs this area around the Beardmore Glacier uh, and especially Mount Kirkpatrick. Uh, so we actually have a lot of vertebrate localities throughout the central Transantarctic Mountains, where I just came back from last winter was working on animals around here. Uh, but our dinosaurs are only from the early Jurassic. Uh, we've got some better age dates now constraining them, putting them uh, a little bit younger than 194 million years. All right, but we still got to get from McMurdo out to our field camp to do that. We rely on the Air National Guard from New York, who flies uh, these LC-130s, which is basically just big military transport plane with one notable difference that you can see uh, kind of patched on to all those wheels or some skis so we can actually land on these big ice runways that we have to create for our camp. So this is our 2010 camp, which is a pretty big undertaking, uh, about 72 or so people at its max, supported 13 different science teams. They're never going to pay for just a paleontologist to go down there. Right, so they've got, you know, physicists, they've got uh, climate scientists, uh, geologists, all kinds of stuff, everything under the sun. And there's a lot of sun. All right, so we're kind of arrayed here. Here's our, our galley. We've got some science tents, engineering, comms tent, uh, our gear lines. This is the suburbs where everybody lives in their little tents. And remember, we're down there during our winter, which is the austral summer. So it's sun 24-7, and we're down there over the holidays. You know, so you've got to kind of come up with your own creative ways to celebrate the holi holidays and patch together a Charlie Brown-esque Christmas tree. You know. And we're actually camping uh, on the ice there. So we're actually at a little neve that's kind of uh, back, set off the glacier, a little more protected from the weather. We're at about 7,000 feet. Where we're actually going to go is take uh, some helicopters to get up to Mount Kirkpatrick, where our dinosaur site is. Thankfully, we don't have to go all the way to the top, but the fossil site is at about 12,500 feet. It's too high to kind of camp at without having some health effects. Uh, and there was a great story about this. Uh, people weren't even looking for dinosaurs there. There was a, a geologist that was measuring the rock sections that was interested in basically when this part, of, uh, this part of Gondwana started to break apart. But he sat down to have a sandwich where some of these sedimentary rocks are exposed. And this is what he saw in the cliff wall, this nice big femur of a dinosaur sticking out. So he called over the paleontologist, said, you guys got to get up here. I think I've got a dinosaur. We've got to start getting this thing out. Uh, and it is hard work out there. The, this is really solicified, um, and so we have to bring some pretty heavy-duty machinery. Uh, this is about a 90-pound tool, um, the jackhammer, not me. Uh, it's actually plugging away there. And at that altitude, it's a pretty good workout. You can see them showing off the bunny boots to stay warm. Uh, and we also, we don't have a lot of time to kind of crank through and, and get our research done. So we've got to move fast. And any paleontologist or any of you that have been out and doing field work, you know, one of the things we, we don't like is overburden, right? That's all that rock that's on top of our fossil layer that doesn't have fossils that we need to get out of the way so we can get down to the good stuff. Uh, now, when we're working out west, places around here, you know, in the, in the Mesozoic, that's easy. We usually just bring along a bunch of undergrads and grad students that have good, healthy backs, and we just let them go at it with the pickaxe and everything. But in Antarctica, we're time limited. Uh, so in 2003, instead of all these grad students, we just brought along Marty. Uh, <laughs> and Marty brings along dynamite. Five, four, three, two, one. Now, it's important, no dinosaurs were harmed during the making of that video. Right? <laughs> we're, just, we're just blowing off the overburden, right? And that was great because it allowed us uh, to get down and to quarry a lot more out so that when we came back in 2010, we actually kind of finished out most of that big uh, quarry where we're getting our dinosaurs from. That was even better because it gave us more time to actually prospect and hop around different regions. Because remember, nobody's actually laid eyes on a lot of this rock in the Hansen Formation. 
And what's really exciting is that only about 50 yards away from that dinosaur quarry, we started finding new skeletons, new stuff. Here is a little excavation pit where we found the skeleton of a, a new dinosaur. And then while we were working on this, my colleague, a guy you've already heard of, Roger Smith, who's got a really good eye for dinosaur skeletons, was mapping the rock contact between our, our sedimentary rock and this, uh, this sandstone body and starts hollering, Nate, Nate, get over here and look at this. And just under that little ledge, you can probably see that orangey bone in there. I'm going to highlight a couple bits. These are some uh, neural arches, some tops of the vertebrae in cross section. So those little spines coming up are the neural spines. If you kind of feel the bumps on the back of your neck, those are your neural spines. Right? So we had kind of the whole skeleton of a dinosaur kind of strewn out underneath this little cliff face. Now, of course, we found this with two days left in the field season, right? So we had to work really, really hard to kind of chunk all this stuff out. And yes, there is a little bit of it still up there, right? Um, but it's a lot of work. This is how we actually get the stuff out once we've kind of defined those big blocks, right? So we can't actually use a lot of plaster and glue at that altitude and temperature. We just kind of got to quarry out big chunks. We'll, we'll log everything in our notebooks, kind of make detailed maps, and then we'll wrap it up in these cargo nets, and then we get to do some other fun stuff. This, this site, uh, we get temperatures down to 20 or 25 below Fahrenheit. It gets quite a bit worse if you're standing under the road to watch. I'm out here from your bread, I guess. the hill it goes and it's going to go back to our big main camp where we're going to kind of go through and crate it up and then put it back on one of those C-130s to go back to McMurdo Station. Then we've got to log it all in and get it put in a shipping container and we get to fly back but the fossils have to take the boat. Right. So it's, it's usually a couple months before they actually arrive in the lab which is then kind of like a second Christmas for us when we start opening things up again. Um, all right, so that's how we get those fossils back from Antarctica. What are we actually finding there in the Hansen Formation? So we'll do kind of a quick rogues gallery of, of what's been around. Well, we actually have some of Ken's favorite critters, uh, these mammal-like reptiles or synapsids. This is a tritylodont, so it's an animal that's not a mammal itself, but kind of a very close relative. We don't have much of it. We don't have a nice skull like this one from the Kayenta Formation out here. Uh, we've got just one of the, the molar teeth of this animal, but enough to kind of tell which group it belongs to. Same kind of thing with the pterosaurs, right? These flying reptiles that are cousins to dinosaurs. We've got an upper arm bone of one of these that looks very similar to other early Jurassic pterosaurs, uh, a little bit beefier and stockier. Um, but the main prize uh, is this animal, Cryolophosaurus alleidae, right? So we actually have now uh, two partial skeletons of Cryolophosaurus. Um, the main holotype one and one that's probably 10 or 15 percent bigger. This is actually the skull. If you look carefully in that shot that I showed earlier with the femur sticking out of the wall, you could see a couple bits of bone that were actually the skull sticking out of the wall too. So that's why we're missing all the toothy bits from the skull. We found a few fragments of them kind of weathered out down the hill a little bit. Um, this is one of our reconstructions of what this might have looked like. And of course he gets his name frozen crested lizard from that big crest that's coming off the top of the head over the eyes. It kind of looks like my hairdo on steroids a little bit <laughs> flopping up there. And in kind of an homage to our earlier speakers, we're actually using all kinds of different techniques now to get an understanding of the paleobiology of these animals. Um, so one of the things we did a few years back was take our skull of Crylovosaurus, and we don't want to cut it open because it's the only one we have. So we drove it up and took it to the Ford, Mo Ford Motor Company in uh, Michigan. And they've got a huge, huge CT scanner there that they use for scanning engine blocks. And they get really bored of scanning engine blocks. So if you tell them, hey, we have a dinosaur head, can you put that in your scanner? They all get really super excited, right? And so they, they scan that up for us, kind of gratis, which is nice. Uh, and we're actually able to do fun stuff like render out what the interior spaces look like, including even the brain. And this is actually a 3D nylon printout, full actual size of a Crylophosaurus brain. You can even see some of the veins coming off here, little stalks from some of the nerves, um, 
parts of the, the inner ear and the semicircular canals. My man, you want to take a look at that? And we do stuff uh, like what Dr. Werning is interested in, looking at osteohistology, right? Because we also want to get an understanding of how old these animals are and what they were growing like. So our samples from Krylovasaurus suggest that this particular individual was probably somewhere in the range of 12 to 15 years old uh, and kind of of a size that corresponds well with an animal like Allosaurus uh, for that age. Right. Now, it's not just these meat-eating dinosaurs. We also have... Uh, a new long-necked dinosaur that we named uh, a little over 10 years ago now, Glacialosaurus hammeri. This one we don't have as much. We've got part of the ankle and foot and part of kind of the knee joint from the, the femur, the upper leg bone. Um, we actually recovered a little bit more on the, the last trip down there and have been preparing that, so we're getting a better understanding of this animal. But thankfully, this part of the anatomy of dinosaurs, their ankles, their legs, are where they're making a lot of changes, so there's all kinds of informative characters that we can reach to there that tell us about the relationships of this animal. Um, but what we're really excited about was that stuff that was under the ledge, right, the new stuff that was coming back. And I'll give you a, a peek at what this kind of looks like when we got it back in the lab. All that orange in there is just bone chalked together. And we had about six different blocks that looked like this, right? So we've got some vertebrae that are mixed in there. We've got some ribs. You've got a hind limb, so here's a femur, the two lower leg bones over here. And what this is, is an, another new species of one of these long-necked dinosaurs, these sauropodomorphs. So these are the early cousins that Dr. Whiteside talked about, the early cousins to the later gigantic um, Diplodocus, uh, Apatosaurus, things like that. What was really exciting about this trip, too, is that we, we collected something that we might call like a blind jacket or blind block. Sometimes when we're out in the field and we're kind of collecting specimens and we've got a bunch of stuff here, a bunch of stuff here, and then we kind of run out of fossil. We might still collect that area of rock and sediment just in case something is in there. Uh, and that kind of paid off for us because in that last little block, we had the skull of this animal, just a gorgeous, gorgeous skull of this new dinosaur. So what are these dinosaurs telling us? Um, this is where we get back into the trees. So hopefully you guys aren't treed out yet. Uh, but I do want to kind of make the case of, of why evolutionary trees are so important to us, right? These are, uh, these are kind of a foundation for a lot of what we do in evolutionary biology and paleobiology. So a tree to a, to a biologist is kind of the same thing as a periodic table is to a chemist. It's not just a way that we can kind of organize biodiversity around us, but it can also have a predictive power, right? It can tell us where and what and what we might find, when we might find it. It can allow us to test hypotheses about diversification, biogeography, patterns across mass extinction boundaries, all kinds of neat things like that that we get from the power of using these evolutionary trees as a framework for our hypothesis testing. And if we look at kind of our previous hypotheses, these were kind of floating around maybe 10 or 15 years ago of kind of carnivorous dinosaur relationships and these long neck dinosaur relationships. I'm just going to draw your attention to these kind of dichotomies on the, on the left side of the, of the tree, where we thought we had these kind of natural groups here that are like the coelophysoids and also these early kind of late Triassic and early Jurassic long necks we called prosauropods. Uh, now, in the past 10 or 15 years, we've been doing a lot of revision of early dinosaur relationships. A lot more focus has been drawn out of the Cretaceous and back into the Triassic. The Triassic is a new black, black now in terms of looking at dinosaur relationships. It's a hot spot. Right? And we've revised a lot of these carnivorous dinosaur relationships and the long neck relationships, and we broke up what we thought were those kind of natural groups. And what you end up with is what we sometimes call a more laterized pattern to the evolutionary tree or genealogy. What this means is that in the case of these long necks, some of these long necks are more closely related to the big sauropods than earlier ones. Right? And so I'm just going to go back because it's a little easier to look at this in cartoon form. This is kind of what we changed. Right. And if, if you weren't too familiar with this, you might say, well, Nate, why do I even care about that? You've just moved a few branches on your tree. It doesn't make a big difference. Well, it does make a big difference when we consider what these trees are doing for us as a framework for hypothesis testing. Right? Because a lot of these lineages that are in the green for our theropods and our prosauropods here are animals that are around during the late Triassic and the early Jurassic. And rearranging those branches on the tree can change patterns of extinction survival across the end Triassic mass extinction. Right? We, may, we may have some missing diversity across that extinction that we're not accounting for. It can also change evolutionary patterns. Right? This is around the time that 
multiple dinosaur groups are kind of exploring and furring into large body size. And how we arrange these taxa in our evolutionary trees implies different patterns about kind of the accrual of body size and other evolutionary traits. These things can also tell us a little bit about biogeography. Right? So if I want to look at in more detail at our Antarctic sauropodomorphs and where they kind of fall in the, the sauropodomorph uh, tree of life, um, Glacialosaurus is a member of this group called the Massospondylids. Some of these guys you might have heard about before. Uh, and when we throw our other new taxa in, an interesting pattern pops up. And that's that they're not actually close relatives of each other. So each of our Antarctic sauropodomorph dinosaurs are kind of distantly related. They've got a close cousin that's from a different geographic region. Right. And that's kind of cool for a, a couple of points. One, it tells us something interesting about what's going on in a, in a bigger global scale with biogeography. Because if we go to other early Jurassic assemblages around the world, we see that pattern repeated, where we might have three or four different sauropodomorphs in North America, but they're not close cousins. They have relatives in other parts of the world. And the early Jurassic of China, it's the same story. Early Jurassic of South America, same story. And Dr. Whiteside hinted at this too when she was talking about these patterns and how they might relate to climate in the late Triassic, where we have these long neck guys really going gangbusters at high latitudes in the north and high latitudes in the south, but nothing established in between. And we know that those climate zones weren't acting as barriers because the animals in the north and south high latitudes are interrelated with each other, right? So we know dispersal was happening between these regions. Things, weren't just, things just were not being established in the low latitudes, right? So a lot of interesting stuff we can get at with biogeography by using these trees as a framework. It also tells us something interesting potentially about the paleobiology of these animals, right? Because during this time, we don't have ice on Antarctica. It's not super, super cold like it is now but it's still probably within a polar circle. And these are animals that are still going to be experiencing three months of light and three months of darkness throughout the year. And so the fact that they're not all related to each other, that they're kind of independently popping out on different parts of the tree, might suggest that if there are any adaptations to that kind of uh, light regime, that they independently are acquiring it, you know, three separate times in these three different lineages. And so those are kind of the takeaways that I want to leave you with uh, about these Antarctic dinosaurs, is that to begin with, in a, in a very broad sense, if we want to understand global processes and patterns, right, if we want to talk about mass extinctions and change that plays out across the Earth, we have to go everywhere to study them, right? We know even nowadays, right, in our modern time, diversity is distributed very differently across latitudes, and we also know that climate change is having different impacts on, on animals and plants at different latitudes. So if we want to piece together what was happening in the past, we have to do it in a global context. Um, the fun part for paleontologists is that going to unexplored regions gives you that chance to find new diversity, right, to discover new stuff. Um, also, we can look in a little more detail using our trees as help, as uh, kind of an, an aid to ask questions about the paleobiology of these animals and also about their biogeographic relationships. Right? And so with that, I'll kind of leave you with a what I hope is a quick teaser is that we've actually, as a result of some of these expeditions and studies, put together an exhibit about Antarctic dinosaurs, the world they lived in, and what it's like to work in Antarctica. Right? And this was actually done in conjunction and partnership with your museum here. So we had Randy and also some of your exhibit folks helping out in kind of the conceptualization, the design and development uh, of this exhibit. So I hope you guys are proud of what they put together because it's becoming here to Utah in June of 2020. All right, this is just kind of a teaser overview of what you're going to be looking at. You'll get, to, you'll get to lay it out a little differently and put your own tweak on that. So that's going to be creating more work for Randy later on. Um, but I hope you're excited about when that exhibit comes here to Salt Lake City. All right, and thank you again for your time. I've got a number of people to thank here. And since I started by talking about Scott, I'll kind of finish with him and the memorial, Scott Cross, that's erected to him, which has kind of an old poem from Tennyson up there. And it was kind of meant to symbolize the courage of these guys coming back on the sled journey, but I also think it's a fitting testament to the spirit of the scientific endeavor and what we do in general, and that's to strive to seek, to find, and not to yield. So thank you again for your time. <laughs>